Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually with you. Um, so I'm Max Decoto. I'm a professor at the University of Sherbrooke. I had the privilege of having Helef Terios as a postdoc way back uh, in 2012, 13, and 14. And um, you know, lots of the um, DiPi tools and DiPi mentality uh, I've been adopting and promoting for, for years now. So I'm very happy to be here. Today, the plan is to separate my talk in several parts. And so you'll see that in the first part, we'll talk about spherical function. What does it mean for a signal to live on the sphere? How do we represent it? What's the diffusion signal? What is the apparent diffusion coefficient on this sphere? Uh, I will introduce also spherical harmonics. And uh, in other parts, we'll get into cue ball imaging, diffusion ODFs, uh, constraint spherical deconvolution, and eventually into multi-shell kind of data with the diffusion propagator and multi-compartment, multi-shell spherical deconvolution. So let's start. Um, just to give you a brief introduction, the holy grail of diffusion weighted MRI is to reconstruct at every voxel this object that I call the diffusion propagator, this P of R the diffusion propagator. So keep that word in mind because this will come in the last parts of the demonstration with all the diffusion propagator techniques. And visually, this means that at every voxel of the brain, right? So this is on the order of millimeters, let's say two by two by two, we have this object P of R in every voxel. So this is very complex object. It's a 3D function within each voxel, right? Because this R here is a vector, and this is a radial component R, an angle theta phi. Okay, so it's it's doable today, but way back when diffusion started, this it was impossible to reconstruct such a large 3D function at every voxel. So as you will see, we will need to make some simplifications to summarize this maybe just on a sphere right if we just keep here theta theta phi then we're left with just a spherical function instead of a whole 3d function and so this is the only equation uh well critical equation linking the signal s of q and s zero this is the b equals zero image with our object p of r so i'll change color here but p of r here which is our diffusion propagator and so for the physicists out there or engineers you see it's related via a fourier transform so we measure in q space here q space is actually in millimeters inverse right so we're measuring in frequency space and the object that we're interested in, the P of R, is in millimeter. It's in real space. So P of R is really in the space of axons and uh, at the scale at which we want to reconstruct um, features of the white matter neuroanatomy. All right, so with this equation, we see some uh, basic math. So uh, the S of Q, right, which is the Q space signal. And Q here is a vector in 3D. R is also the real, it's a real space. And it's also a vector in 3D. And what you see here appearing for the first time is the ODF which only depends on theta and phi. So this is a spherical function, where here we've integrated, sorry, so I'll remove the, we've integrated the radial part to have a sphere. Okay, and this will come back in some code later. Uh, so this, this is a 3D object, this is a 3D object, this is a 2D object, and this will have an impact on how we deal with it in DiPi. So 
a spherical function, um, SF. In a lot of the DiPi code, you'll see SF sometimes, the acronym. This is spherical function. What does it mean? Well, it simply means we have a sphere. So here, illustrated by this grid, this spherical mesh, and you have a number at every point on this sphere. And you will see in my demo, we can have several points, like hundreds and thousands of points on the sphere, or just a few points. Like if you're, you're doing DTI acquisition with 32 directions, well, you have 32 such theta phi, 32 direction. So you have a number for each of these points. So either you assign a color or something we always do is we actually scale the radius of the sphere according to the value, right? So the value here is 0.9 and here is 0.6. And so the, 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 the radial amplitude of the sphere is actually the value. So this gives us a good visual representation of the spherical function. But in a sense, it's just like a 2D image, but we don't have a pixel grid. Here we have a mesh, a spherical grid. So we're in a manifold, a 2D manifold parameterized by theta and phi. So this is a spherical function. So keep that in mind. As soon as you see SF in DiPi code, it's a spherical function. Right. So I just want to come back to this uh, overview of the talk. So we have this link between the diffusion propagator, P of R, our signal S of Q in the 3D world. And today, uh, you have other demonstration this week by other talks. We're taking this route here of um, not tissue model, so not biophysical modeling of the tissue like the Nadi model or their multi-tensor model. Here we're taking the route of model-free techniques. So we're just going to play around with mathematical tools that allow us to capture the diffusion signal, the diffusion ODF, the ODF, or the diffusion propagator. And so lots of options to measure the signal Q, and uh, we'll see a few of those options today. So either you can measure Q on a grade, on a grid, this is often called DSI, or Q space imaging, depending on this grid. Uh, there are radial sampling schemes that are less popular, but otherwise when we talk about single shell, this is single shell versus multi-shell, which in a sense means single B value versus multi B value. And so anything within this sampling scheme will have an impact on the spherical function, on the propagator, on the ODF you can extract. This is just another representation where this is DSI, this is single shell, and this is different multi-shell versions. As opposed to the first row, which is more the classical DWI for one direction, for XYZ direction, 1D Q space imaging or the basic six directional DTI, right? So today we'll mostly be focusing on single shell and a bit of multi-shell data. Right, so spherical harmonics. Why do we need spherical harmonics? Spherical harmonics are a basis function for any spherical function on the sphere. Just like sines and cosines for Fourier transforms in imaging, spherical harmonics is basically a Fourier transform on the sphere. So just a reminder for everybody, what is a basis? Uh, for instance, here you have a basis example of the canonical X, Y, Z directions in 3D, right? This is X, Y, and Z. And you can basically reconstruct any 3D point by a linear combination of red, green, blue, or X, Y, Z, right? So if you take any X, Y, Z, you can compute it by X times red plus Y times green 
plus z times the blue vector. Well, spherical harmonics is the same idea. You can actually reconstruct any spherical function on the sphere just with a series of spherical harmonics coefficients. It's just a bit more complicated than the x, y, z vectors because in, in principle or in theory, you have an infinite number of spherical harmonics, a bit like the Fourier transform. So we're going to have to truncate our basis for a specific order. So it has a mathematical formulation. You see a complex number here. It looks like a sine and cosine on the sphere with a normalization factor. Let's not focus on the math. You guys can read that on your own. But essentially, the, the, the picture here is the most powerful one. That is, given any spherical function, you can actually express it as a linear combination of a bit of a sphere, a bit of this guy, a bit of this guy, and a bit of this guy to reconstruct my crossing fiber here, for example, which would be the spherical function that I'm trying to express. So it's a way, a model-free way to reconstruct the signal, but also in a way to compress it, right? Because if you have thousands of points on the sphere, or even just 32 diffusion weighted images, you can actually just project that on a few, in this case, 15 coefficients of the spherical harmonic spaces. Um, and so given a certain grid and a certain sphere for a certain B value, this is single shell acquisition. So you have you know, a diffusion weighted image for each of these points. So this would be diffusion weighted image one for direction one, diffusion weighted image two for direction two, diffusion image three for direction three, and on and on like that. Um, this would be a spherical function, right? DWI for each direction. And we could project that on a spherical harmonic basis. And the way to do that is basically to implement a Fourier transform on the sphere. So given a signal, sorry, given a signal on the sphere and your basis elements, you're just trying to find the coefficients. How much of this element you need for this representation? And there's really nothing else to that. So finding the spherical harmonics coefficient of a diffusion signal, whether it's a spherical function, the diffusion data itself, an ADC or an ODF, it's always the same process. So DiPi will allow you to build this matrix. This we often call it the SH matrix. And given any signal, will return to you these coefficients C. So, and this is actually the algorithm that's going on. There's a small regularization going on, but DiPi will build these different matrices and implement this uh, least squared or pseudo inverse uh, spherical harmonics transform to provide the, the, the coefficients. Um, and so this is a great way to go from any sphere to the basis and then to also go to another sphere, let's say for visualization. So this will, you'll see that in my demo, but with this tool, it's easy to start from, let's say DTI data from 32 directions, go on the spherical harmonics basis of 15 coefficients, and then project back to, let's say 5,000 points on the sphere to have a sexy visualization, because only this B matrix will do the trick of extrapolating data to a bigger sphere, if you wish. Um, there's also a small, in practice, a small regularization parameter coded in DiPi. So this is why it's called the, the inverse, pseudo-inverse smooth. So this is, comes from a, you know, several papers and years of research. Uh, you shouldn't really have to play with that, but you, it's good to know that we do actually have a small regularization just to stabilize the the, um, the spherical harmonics tr transform. So I'm going to take a break here um, and cut the video. 
and then switch to my demo to just show you what that looks like in um, in practice. So I'm going to take over here. So um, I've given you uh, two Jupyter notebooks. One is part one and part two uh, with a requirements file. So you can just on your Linux or Mac uh, pip install the requirements, which will go fetch the right DiPy, Jupyter notebook, and all that. You can then just call um, Jupyter notebook. This will launch uh, in your browser. And you will find these two tutorials. So let's start with the first tutorial, which is DiPy tutorial on reconstruction of the diffusion signal. So you can just run the first few things. I'm going to get the DiPy modules that we need for this. So a little bit of fury for visualization and some of the basic imports to simulate voxels, to extract spheres and play with spheres and different signals, just to illustrate what I mean by a spherical function and a spherical harmonic. So these are just visualization tools. You can read the code or you know, get inspired by this, but I'll just run them. So first, you know, the apparent diffusion coefficient versus spherical harmonics. So let's just start by this little block of code here. So you'll see I'm generating 64 directions on the sphere. So this looks like a single shell at B value 1000 data with 64 directions. And I could change that to 32 or 100. You can play with this code. I'm going to generate the 64 randomly generated directions on the sphere for that. On the hemisphere, and then I'm going to spread them out over the sphere using the dispersed charge algorithm. So this is the static repulsion force algorithm from Derek Jones to more or less distribute 64 directions uniformly on the sphere. And then I'm going to create my classic gradient table for diffusion. And you see I'm printing in it here. I'm adding a B0 image. So a B0 image is with a B value of 0 and a vector of 0, 0, 0. And then you see my 64 directions, which are just x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. And I'm also adding a last B0 image. And these are my B values. So if I run this and I show you what it looks like, this is a 64 directional scheme uniformly distributed on the sphere, something I could export in a text file and then bring to my MRI scanner to actually run a diffusion weighted imaging protocol with these 64 directions, right? If I had 12 directions or 32 directions, this would be a DTI-like protocol. Now here with 64 directions, this is more like a hardy single shell B1000 protocol. So now I have my grid, right? I have my sphere. Now I can assign values to these green points. So here's a, few, a small example to generate signal in DiPi, either with one fiber, two crossings, three crossings, you guys decide. Right now in my example or my demo, this is fixed to two. And I'm generating a simulated multi-tensor signal. So this is the most traditional and simple way to generate fake signal. So let's run this. And as you can see here, this looks like a signal now on the sphere, right? I just have a ball with numbers on it, just like in my slides. It has a bit of a weird shape. So let's, let me just change this to a one and run this and run this little code here. You know, so a single shell, a single fiber signal looks more like a disk or a sphere with a big ring. Now, so this is more familiar if I run this code, right? The only difference here between these two calls is that I, I said, please normalize the sphere. This is true now. 
So on this top example, the sphere is not normalized, false. And here on this bottom example, this is a normalized signal. So it looks like the famous single fiber donut. Right, so this, this the fiber here is aligned with the blue area. So I'll put this back to two, just so you have an idea of what it looks like with a two fiber signal, which complicates things and looks a bit weirder. Um, it looks like, a, doesn't look like much though. So that's, that's the first thing to note is you would never wanna start doing fiber tracking on this object, you can see that actually the signal is blue, it's the weakest where you have, um, well, or some directions. All right, so this is a spherical function. So values on 64 points of the sphere. Now, if I take the log of this signal, I actually get the ABC. So we'll go back to my slides and see that. But the apparent diffusion coefficient is related by an exponential, a negative exponential. So you just taking the log of the diffusion signal, you get the ADC. And so suddenly the ADC now looks more, you know, like a crossing fiber object. Turns out to not be properly uh, parameterized to to do fiber tracking, but you at, at least see that this, this object is a two fiber compartment object. So again, the non-normalized version versus the normalized version. Okay. And finally, in this little demo, uh, that what I wanna show you is the spherical harmonics. So now if I get the spherical harmonics model from the reconstruction module of DiPi, I can really do a lot of things. I can declare a matrix of order two. This will be just a six by six matrix that looks like DTI. Order four will be 15 by 15, uh, not, well, the 15 by the number of directions, sorry. And order eight will be 45 coefficients. So if I play this, you can see that at order two, I have six spherical harmonics, order four, 15, Order eight, I have 45. And now I did, the last thing I did is I got a sphere from DiPi that's a lot more tessellated. So it's not these 64 directions that I had originally, but now I'm loading 724 uh, directions on the sphere. And I'm subdividing it by a factor of four or two, which makes me, gives me a sphere with 11,000 points. So this is a crazy, very highly tessellated sphere. And you'll see why I do this. This is just to have good visualization. Um, and so suddenly, you see suddenly my sphere is uh, not originally not super tessellated, but if I use my super sphere, you can see the difference here. So here I have a, a thou, uh, 11,000 points on the sphere versus this one that has 64 points. And if you miss the math, so I'm going a bit quickly, but you guys can dissect this and digest this later while you go through my code. Well, to get the spherical harmonic signal, as we saw in my slides earlier, I'm taking the pseudo inverse so the dot product between the inverse of the B matrix and the original signal on the sphere. So this is a spherical function. This is the B matrix, so the SH matrix. And what I get as a return is the spherical harmonics coefficient. You see the math here in comments. And so I have a way to go from the sphere to the coefficients and back to the sphere with any spherical harmonics matrix, right? because then I can apply the highest resolution B matrix to go back to the sphere. So it's a very nice way, a linear transform way to go from signal to circle harmonics back to the sphere for any resolution we want. Um, so the zero further circle harmonic is the sphere. 
The second order spherical harmonics looks like a diffusion tensor, and the high order spherical harmonics allows us to get crossing factors. 